I want to sort of wrap up the paintings today, I hope. We'll see what happens. Uh, because I've got a lot of pictures and we only have a half an hour or more. Um, and we'll get to his prints definitely on Tuesday. Okay. Um, so we left off talking about Rembrandt. He's, he began his career right in Leiden. He's doing all of these interesting sort of studies that are really aiming him toward a career as a, uh, as a history painter. Right? That's, what he wants to, that's the most noble kind of painter. Right? And it's written at the time as being the most appreciated kind of painting, right? The one that brings the artist the most glory, okay? And that's what Rembrandt wants from his career. He wants to be the artist he's known. And he was pretty successful for the day <coughs> at first, right? He falls on hard times later. So we had talked about some of these head studies that he's doing, right? Uh, that begin to elaborate these things that he learned from Peter Lastman about how to make a good history painting, right? Uh, make it about humans, right? <coughs> Fill it full of interesting still life details, right? That that can enliven the scene and make it engaging with the viewer. And we went, we ended up talking at the very end of the class about a sort of anti-classical approach to painting, a non-idealized form that Rembrandt uses a lot, right? And the female body here does not really conform to the traditions of Renaissance Baroque female bodies. Now they tend to be larger than today, right? But Rembrandt's are particularly bold, right? And that, coupled with the way he paints, with these really thick paints that kind of stumble down, like you see on the, the rocks beneath Andromeda Green, right? And these are it's sort of running counter to the norm of how you paint, right? And there's some questions of whether or not Rembrandt is sort of consciously challenging traditions and conventions with the idea that he's, he's going to set himself apart from the crowd, right? And that, again, the idea is to bring him uh, uh, greater glory. So he's moved to Amsterdam, right, in 1631. He'd already been there once for about two years, uh, studying under Lassmann. And now he's gone back after spending time in Leiden, uh, you know, cutting his chops, as it were, right, getting started. And he goes back to become a history painter. Um, in order to make money, he also begins to do portraits, now, portraits were seen in the 17th century as being sort of menial work. And the reason a portrait was seen as kind of menial work is that if Margaret wants a portrait from me and I'm going to paint it, and, and you don't agree with how it looks, I don't get paid, right? You get to tell me exactly what you want to look like. And that doesn't work the same way with a, with a history picture, right? Especially something done for the open market, because then you come to me and say, okay, I like that one, I'll take it home with me, right? And give you 200 bucks. But in this case... Uh, Martin Solmans, an opium coppet, came to him up front and paid him to start a painting and then would pay him the rest when he was done, right? And so because you were so enslaved, is that a good word? It's kind of harsh, but that's how they saw it, right? Because you were enslaved to the desire of the sitter, a lot of people really looked down on portraiture, but it paid really well. Right? And so if you wanted to be a groundbreaking history painter, you still had bills to pay. And painting portraits was a way to do that. Right? Do the menial stuff so you can do the stuff you love. Right? And for those of you who are art majors out there, just think about that. It's like working at McDonald's while you're working on your paintings. You know? Who wants to do it? Right? Okay, so Rembrandt becomes almost immediately a very popular portrait painter as well. Right? It really, uh, in, in pretty high demand as a portrait painter. Right? And in fact, these, I believe, are the only two full-length portraits he ever did. He usually does these bust lengths, right? half-length portraits. And these, I think, are the only two full-length portraits he ever did. And we think they were commissioned uh, to commemorate the first anniversary of their marriage. Right? And so all the things you see, like those amazing shoes, right? those, the roughs on his shoes, he ain't walking outside in the mud, in the vomit, you know, uh, with those on. But I love that he's taking his, he's, look at how he's holding his glove in his left hand, right? Because he's going to shake your hand. And it's rude to shake somebody's hand when you're wearing a glove, right? Because the whole point of shaking your hand is that contact. And he's, so he's here to, to greet us, right? This is their wedding commemoration uh, between the two of them. And uh, typical Dutch clothing, right? That Calvinist restraint insofar as color is concerned. But they allowed a sort of leeway with, with lace, right? Uh, extremely foppy. 
One of his earliest, sorry, Wi-Fi slow. There we go. One of his earliest commissions on arriving in Amsterdam uh, was this. It's a really important group portrait, right? So the kind of portraiture different from just a single person, a group portrait. And it was actually commissioned by the Surgeons Guild in Amsterdam. And Dr. Culp on the right was the, uh, the dean of the Surgeons Guild in Amsterdam. And he was also teaching at the brand new University of Amsterdam, which had only recently been founded. And it, one of its uh, hallmarks programs was its medicine program, right? So first rate medical program. And so Dr. Culp, please, hang on a second, take a look at that. Um, not pixelated there. Better. Uh, Dr. Culp is, is in both camps, right? And this is commissioned by the guild. So it's not commissioned by Culp himself. And it shows him in the act of teaching. And it shows for us something about Rembrandt and portraiture that I think is really fascinating, which is that even though people look down on portraits, maybe because people look down on portraits, Rembrandt, when he paints portraits, does something to pay attention to the portrait. Right? They end up looking different in portraits than when they look. And what he does in this picture and other pictures is he makes it into a little narrative rather than just right? Good job. Uh, we have an activity going on that we try to understand. So Culp isn't posed with members of the guild. He's shown in the act of teaching. This is what he's been supposed to teach, right? So that enlivens the portrait, right? It makes it not strictly portraiture in, in a kind of weird way, even though it still is, right? It sort of adds an element to it. And I think on a certain level, what Rembrandt's trying to do with this is to sort of toll. He's getting all these portrait commissions, make portraiture more noble, right? Make portraiture bring the artist more nobility. Yeah? And it really is a terrific picture. And all these things that he was doing with face studies and emotion studies really come through. And I just love this as, as a scene of, of teaching. This is what we all hope when we're up here, is that you guys are like that, <laughs> right? Leaning in is like, I can't wait to hear the next thing they say. And of course, when we go home, that's what we believe really happened. When in fact, we know. We know when you're asleep. Right? And so the, the utterly engaged student, it's kind of idealized, right? It's idealized from a teacher's point of view. Uh, I guess you guys would love it if classes were like that. You just couldn't wait for the next shoe to drop, right? So there they are. They can't wait. He's, he's in there, and he's doing something gory. Um, Tulp had written a book. Right? And he seems to be teaching, we think, from his book, although the words can't really be read in that book that's in the foreground. Right? But it's out there as a sort of a lesson piece. And it's, it's quite oversized. right? Look at the size of that book. It's, it's huge. right? So that's, that's there sort of as a symbol or a sign. Right? And he's using it to teach. And the book said something very specific about what he's doing right now. And I'll tell you that in a second. Maeve. These are photos that I took, yes. No, I don't. Well, I can't make it more crisp than he painted it. Right. No, and in fact, one of the things he does here that he does quite a bit is you'll notice how that book, almost as if the pages kind of come out of the frame. It really looks like it's, it's sort of bridging the gap between where we are and where the people in the painting are, right? That it becomes sort of almost like it's part of our world. It's, and we, we talked before about how the Dutch sort of champion realism, right? Now, Rembrandt, insofar as the kind of uh, selective focus that you're talking about, May, it's something that he will do, right? So you'll notice the feet are, are fuzzier, right? This is pretty sharp, right? Because you can see the, uh, some of the cracks on the panel. That's what my camera focused on. Right? I'll tell this. And so he's painted the feet somewhat fuzzier, right? Now, you'll have a chance to see it, too. It's huge, right? It's about as big as one of these panels on the wall, maybe a little bit bigger than that, right, these whiteboard panels. Uh, so it's, it's fairly about five feet across, right? 
people are roughly life size in this. Okay? And the colors are a bit off here. The room has got green wallpaper, so my camera got a little tweaked toward the yellow in this. Right? Um, so he's teaching from his book, and another nice detail, uh, okay, uh, trying, trying, there we go. The guy in the back is actually sketching as he takes notes as well, right? He's drawn the body here. Uh, so he's not just writing, but he's taking notes. And when I was an undergrad, I was always sketching when I took notes. Students would help me remember stuff, you know. And I'm all for that. That's the other reason not to use your computer. Use your computer right? uh, like this. And so he's got a leg and an arm, and that's part of the notes he's been taking, right? Now, one of uh, Tulp's biggest breakthroughs, uh, not biggest breakthroughs, one of his more famous precepts was that anatomy, there was an element of human anatomy that made us better than animals. And what he said, what he argued was, the thing that makes better than animals is that we have a sense of proportion, right? That the opposable thumb sets us apart from all the other creatures in the world. Now, he wasn't thinking about things like femurs and whatnot, right, that have a sense of proportion, but nonetheless, right? The, the ability to, right, you're opposed, you know that, right? This is your, what you can do this. My dog can't do that, right? Anyway, it can't, it's hard to grab things. I mean, my dog grabs like that, right? And we can do this. And that's what he's doing with his hand, right? Because he's showing us the thing that makes us better than animals. And with the body that he's dissecting, right, during the anatomy lesson, he's also showing us how that works. So what he's doing is he's pulling up the tendons in the arm, and he's basically, if he yanks that tendon up like this, the corpse's hand will do this, Right? And he's, so he's, he's doing that with his forceps. So the same thing, you see, it's going to make him do this. And sure enough, he's going to do that, right? So he's teaching the one thing that he was really most famous for was this hypothesis that what made us great, distinct from other animals, was our opposable thumb. And that's exactly what he's teaching here, right? To pose the scene, um, Rembrandt went out and got a corpse of a thief that had recently been hung. And we can identify him, apparently. I don't know how they did this, how they figured it out, but apparently he's identifiable. Maybe there's a, a 17th century record of somebody talking about that. But his face is a portrait, which is, again, that realism, unflinching realism of 17th century art. Ars Kint was his name. And even though that looks entirely realistic, it's not. Because in any anatomy lesson, any, any health sciences group? What's the first thing you do with a corpse, you know? I took an A and P when I was an undergrad, so I was, I was drawing. Uh, well, lucky you, yet. I took I took human anatomy and physiology, so I was doing a lot of life drawing as an undergrad, and I, I wanted those muscles, right? I was thinking about the nerve, and then because I'd done the skin and the life drawing class, I wanted to know what the muscles were. I took A and P, so those were tough on me. The A and P came in. Uh -huh. We had a human, and we skinned him, and uh, that was really disgusting. Um, everything except the face and the uh, naughty bit. The naughty bit. In fact, our, our TA said, we're going to leave that as a joke. If you don't do that. <laughs> anyway, long and the short of it is, right, the first thing that you do with the corpse is you gut it, because that's going to spoil it. Right? And so you have to, the first thing before the corpse goes on the table is there, you get the insect. Right? And study them separately. But he doesn't. So it's really utterly inaccurate for what an anatomy lesson really looks like, even though he's accurate in, in, in painting the, the face of this. Right now it's blue lips, right? And the eyes, the blood from the face, right? Um, it's, it's a little difficult to look at, isn't it? I mean, because it's, mm, right? Uh, but at the same time, and by the way, that year I didn't have Thanksgiving dinner because I couldn't. I was like, muscles all look like muscles look like muscles. Right? Like, yeah. yeah. Just do things like frogs and cats? No, not cats. They became pigs. 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 We did cats, too. Yeah, I know, right? I don't like cats. Those are okay. Yeah. Right? Now, um, he was able to get this major commission, right? It was a monster commission for this thief. And really a big feather in Rembrandt's cap, and it will bring in more business. The way 
he got this commission was through his bureau. When he moved to Amsterdam, he started working for this guy named Hendrik van Allenburg, who was a prominent Amsterdam art dealer. And art dealers in the 17th century were somewhat different from contemporary art dealers. And what Allenberg did is he had this house, this fairly large house. And he would have young artists actually live there, rent the rooms, right? And they painted specifically for him and he would then sell them. Right? And they would pay for some of the living expenses. So it was sort of like a commune, if you will, an artist commune, right? And Rembrandt moves in with Allenberg and almost immediately becomes his sort of go-to artist for major commissions because he's so good, right? And it's Allenberg that gets Rembrandt the doctor's whole commission, right, from the university. Okay? Now this worked out pretty well because Rembrandt met Allenberg's niece, Saskia, and they get married a couple years later. So he marries his dealer's niece, Saskia van Allenberg. And they are apparently idyllically happy. They love each other to no end. It, it's really very charming, right? And she's got the money. She has a dowry because her father had recently been the mayor of another town. So she's really prominent in this place. And Rembrandt, remember, he's the son of a mill owner, right? He's marrying up the social ladder by marrying Saskia, right? She funds him. He's able to go independent at that point, open his own studio, brings a lot of money to the household. There's actually a prenup, right? If Saskia is to die, the money will go to their children. If they don't have any children, it goes back to her family, right? So there's, right, it's, it's kind of a sticky situation. They know Rembrandt's a commoner, right, is what they might have called him, okay? Well, he takes some of that money, and he buys the house next door to Allenberg's, which is still there, right? So I think Allenberg is either where this extension of the Rembrandt house is. This is Rembrandt's house. That's the house he buys. So either this one or this one was Allenberg's. I'm not quite sure which one. Right? But he literally buys the house next door, sets up shop next door to Uncle Hendrik, right? And uses some of Saskia's money for this, right? And it's a really big house, and we'll have a chance to see it at another time. Right? There's really a lot to it, and, and meet with the curators there and see some things there. But he begins to take his own studio, and he models his practice exactly on Allenberg's practice, which is he's going to get young students working for him, and he'll sell their work. Right? Rembrandt does something slightly different, and it might sound unethical, but it wasn't in the 17th century. He has the right to sign his students' work. Now, he was not a pupil of Allenberg, right? So Allenberg couldn't sign his work. He was a dealer. But Rembrandt has a teacher who will regularly, basically owns the work that his students produce. When I was an undergrad, that was the way, right? So when I graduated from college, my, my college got to keep one or more of my work that they wanted to, right? Unless I could find somebody else to buy it. They would keep it, right? If they wanted it, they would put it in the paper. We, at least when we graduated, would like to work, right? We'll just buy it. Yeah, it's a few important things that would do that, right? That they kept it. So that's why I went to Britain with them. You know, I was like, geez, right? So anyway, Rembrandt, right, sets up this studio. He apparently takes on more students than he should have, or was normal at the time, at least. Right? Try to do some scans after that. There's a lot more scans. Of it. Here's Rembrandt teaching with students around him, right? That's him in the middle with the coffee hat. Um, students crowded around. Down below, pretty much the same day, maybe, with a different pose and a different, I mean, these are both pupils drawing, right? Bust on the rack up above. You can see that the range of students is everything from kids to a little old man, right? With uh, bald head and, I think, I don't know who's watching, right? The little old man with bald head and glasses. And a beard, right? So he has a range of students. Uh, they're not just uh, college age kids that he's tutoring in this massive house. As a teacher, Rembrandt did a number of different things, but it seems that most of his pupils were trained to paint like Rembrandt. Right? And then they would go off on their own, and some of them continued to paint like Rembrandt, and some of them moved to a completely different style. Right? So Hobart Flink is a Rembrandt pupil. And as you can see, his picture is a pretty direct copy of a picture by Rembrandt. 
three folds of space that I can paint now. And remember, if we keep some of these paintings made for the open market, right, history pictures, which is what they like to load at Scoville, and use them as instructional pieces for his students. But we don't do much of that here, copying other people's work, do we? That would take some really um, super impressionist. You know, all, we wanted, all we wanted is originality. Right? There's something to be said for copying. My wife is taking, both my wife and I have studio art degrees, and she's looking at painting me from time to time, and she's, she keeps saying, I can't copy you because I have gone through my teeth, you know? And now it's just, there's so many good lessons to learn, right? So Scamay does it in, as an etcher, right? You want to sort of see, how did Rembrandt make the animals, right? And how, if I wanted to do a portrait etching, or if I wanted to do a, a landscape etching, you could, you could do well by just copying it, right? Because then eventually you go, OK, now I know what to do with this, right? Now I know how that works. And that's kind of the way Rembrandt taught his pupils, not only in uh, painting, but in printmaking as well, which we'll see. Another copy, Garrett Dow, or excuse me, Bolt, Ferdinand Bolt, also a Rembrandt uh, pupil. And again, he's making very, very direct copies of Rembrandt. Okay. And again, with history figures, uh, Christ showing up. Again, visions, right? The uh, miraculous appearance of Christ to Mary Magdalene um, after, his, after his resurrection. Right? Again, a few of his images with Rembrandt. Now, as we're talking about Rembrandt developing this career, right, uh, early on in Amsterdam, in his early success as an Amsterdam painter, uh, back when he was in Leiden, he made friends with a very important man named Augustine Tauli, uh, a humanist scholar who had actually been a member of the royal court. Now, remember we talked about the fact that the royal court was kind of different there, right? But the heirs of... Um, William of Orange, William the Silent, right? We're still looking for them princes. They had some status at court, but they weren't major art painters, right? But they did have some say, right, in, in how things worked, mostly militarily, and they had some status. And Augustine Hauglitz was part of that court uh, under Prince Frederick Hendrick, who I think was the grandson of, of William of Orange. And Rembrandt becomes friends with Haugen very early on. I would love this stuff. Sees it when he's still in Leiden and writes in his journals and writes to other people that there's a lot of artists out there right now, but you know who's really good? This Rembrandt guy and the other guy, John, John Lehman, who are sharing the studio in Leiden, right? They're the real, they're, they're what Dutch art's going to all be about, right? He's a huge champion of Rembrandt's work. Um, but he's also a humanist interested in all the arts, and you see him in his portrait with uh, his music on the screen, right? He gets Rembrandt. Another commission that's extraordinary, right? So the Dr. Kolk picture that's in the Morris house in the corner, huge, important commission. You're going to bring more money, right? Haugen gets him a commission for Frederick Hendrick, the Prince of the Netherlands. Wants some history paintings to decorate his palace. He just stood up all over the place. We're not going to paint them, but it's a huge and important commission. He says, "Why don't you try Rembrandt?" So Frederick Hendrick says, fine, have him send me a couple pictures and I'll see. Right? And so in 1633, Rembrandt begins to paint history pictures with this extraordinary venue in mind, right? Possibly going into um, the royal palace, right? In The Hague. Okay. He bases the composition on Rubens, the most important painter maybe anywhere in Europe at the time. It's Peter Paul Rubens. And he does the same scene. I think we saw these side by side, didn't we, the first day of class, right? We were talking about how Rembrandt's nowhere near as dramatic as Rubens, right? Well, Rubens is in Antwerp. And Antwerp to Amsterdam, God, in a car now, it's about an hour and a half, right? So that's a, a day's ride, right? Rembrandt never went to Antwerp, so far as we know. He never left Holland. He never left uh, the Low Countries, ever, right? But he would have known it through prints through reproductive prints, engravings that reproduce the composition in reverse. And that's why his cross goes the other direction, right? But as we look at it, what we talked about the first day of class is it doesn't have the sort of uh, writhing energy that Rubens has. Right? The muscularity 
is nowhere near so pronounced. What would a comma say? Yeah. 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 He's nowhere near as relaxed. Right. He's not been. He's not been taken care of. Right. And if you look at the body of Christ here, you compare it to the body of Christ in the rulers, it's, it's really kind of night and day that way, right? It's a more normal body. Now, that's about as athletic a body as you'll ever get from, a, from, from Rembrandt as well, right? And it's still not that much, except sometimes it's just running on legs, right? And the people that are raising the cross, right? Rubens has got all of these people, right? And Rembrandt has a few, but most of them are hidden in shadow, right? And there's some effort. I love this guy here, right? Pulling it up from the from the foot space, and the others are supporting it around, right? But it doesn't have that sense of concerted energy and sort of NFL musculature, you know, uh, coming together to, to raise the cross. Rembrandt does something interesting here is he uses one of his costume studies almost directly in the background. He almost never does that, have it to be this close of a transcription, right? Usually these things, this was in the Met in New York, Usually these things would simply sort of fill his memory, and he would just sketch them from memory. But at this point, he's 26 years old, so he's still relatively young, and he's using it as a more direct one-to-one -one sort of sketch, right? And he appears back there as the supervisor of the crucifixion. Right? Um, there's our body of Christ, nowhere near, like I said, as musculature as Rubens had been, uh, more muscular than muscular than Rembrandt tends to. The blood's a little kind of queasy in its way, uh, but again, in, in extraordinarily realistic. Um, nice details of the, of the people pulling up the cross, and we can see some more hands on the cross as we move our way around from the back. And there's a, there are a group of people here that are raising the cross, but they're, they're not like Rubens' figures. They're sort of in more mundane way. This is how you Thing out. They're not this theatrical, serpentine posing uh, that Rubens did. And amidst all that, we've got Rembrandt right there, helping to raise the cross. And I've always found that kind of fascinating um, because he's there crucifying Christ. Right? And he's not the soldier who is the verse. He's sort of that empty kind of guy. And this would be a nice place to end this today, but for Rembrandt, I, I think this is kind of an important thing because he doesn't, in, in all of his big paintings, he doesn't see himself as someone looking down on as someone who sits in judgment of people who are his visitors. That's not the way he approaches art. He sees himself as everybody. Right? He's one of them. And for all, for, for, okay, for, pretend we're Christians, or if you're not, pretend you're Christians for a second. The reason Christ died, it, it's my fault, right? From a Christian standpoint, Jesus died because I sinned, right? We all raise the cross in one way or another from a Christian standpoint. And remember that he gets that, right? That he puts himself there not as, as if, did you ever see Clockwork Orange? Right? Remember how Alex at the end of that imagines himself as the guy who's whipping Christ and he's having fun because he's just wicked evil, right? Well, that's not what Rembrandt's doing. He doesn't imagine himself there as if he's reveling in torturing Christ. He puts himself there because he's a soldier, right? It's his fault. And I think that makes him much more eloquent in a way, much more coherent in a way. Right? Well, Long story short is he sends two of these immediately to Frederick Hendrick, right, in 1633, a raising and a descent from the cross. He sends these off to Frederick Hendrick. He's going to inspect them to see if he likes them. He's questioning Haugen, telling me the truth, right? Is Rembrandt all that Haugen says he is? He sends these off, and Frederick Hendrick says, oh, yeah, I want them. And over the next three years, Rembrandt paints three more, right? So we have the... Crucifixion, deposition, there's entombment, uh, the angel rolling away, right? The beginning of the resurrection, and here's Christ ascending into heaven over the next few years. And in fact, one of the few writings we have about Rembrandt is Frederick Hendrick writing them saying, Why is it taking so long? <laughs> Why don't I have my pictures yet? I paid you, right? Where are they? You know, there's a one that doesn't come up for about six or so years. Yeah, maybe. 
He did prints of the of the deposition. And you'll come up there and you talk about the deposition. That's very well possible. There's a very few productive prints of that. Yeah. But the other thing about his prints is that he would take these same subjects and kind of redo them in a slightly different way. But he did an actual reproduction of the second one in the series. Okay, I'll see you guys on Tuesday. We'll do a little bibliography exercise and, and dive back into Rembrandt's.